Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ginny. I'm with Anderson's Bookshops, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual author event tonight with Lonnie Taylor and her special guest, Stephanie Perkins. Welcome, ladies. We are really glad to have everyone with us tonight. Um, as a reminder, if you can leave your video and your audio off, please, so that we can focus on our presenters for the evening. Thank you very much for taking the time to keep your eyes on yet another screen to talk books with us tonight. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Anderson's is an independent bookstore outside of Chicago. We've been owned and run by the Anderson family for going on six generations. Um, so we like to say we've survived one pandemic, the flu pandemic of 1918. We're going to survive this one too, but it takes support for everyone, which is what you're doing this evening. And we just like to take a moment to thank you for that because it is very personal and appreciated by us. Um, and we know you have lots of things to do with your time as you're uh, looking at a screen. So we appreciate you doing this. So normally we'd be having this event in person along with uh, almost 400 others during a normal year, whatever that means anymore. But we're hoping this virtual style can uh, keep us all tied over until we can be together again in person, hopefully very soon. We miss seeing your faces in person. We do have other virtual events on our calendar, um, just one more this year actually, but a whole slew starting next year for all ages and interests. So we'd love for you to check out our website, which is andersonsbookshop.com to find the next one that interests you. We are um, hosting Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver tomorrow. If you're middle grade readers or you're a fan of the Fonz, he's delightful and so is Lynn, so don't miss that. Um, and then next month, I don't even know if we've announced this yet, but I'm gonna tell you guys anyway. Um, Alexandra Bracken, we are gonna have her back and um, a dual event with Len Blahos and Judy Halpern. So those are two of the YA events we're doing. A bunch of other stuff going on. So um, when we can get through this holiday season and then you need some things to keep yourself busy in January when it's dark and cold, uh, we've got options for you there as well. So this evening though, we are really happy to welcome back to Anderson's, the New York Times bestselling author, Lonnie Ta Lainey Taylor, excuse me, to celebrate the 10th anniversary, can you believe it, of the Daughter of Smoke and Bone series, those gorgeous new covers. Hey. I'm going to give you the official bio because that makes everybody feel official. Um, oh, there it is. It's even prettier. <laughs> oh, and, and oh it's so screen. pretty. I love it. Outrageously so. Ah, love it. So Lainey Taylor is the New York Times bestselling author of the Prince Honor book, Strange the Dreamer, and its sequel, Muse of Nightmares. She's also the author of the global sensation, The Daughter of Smoke and Bone Trilogy, and the companion novella, Night of Cake and Puppets, which is an amazing title, I just have to say. Uh, Taylor's other works include The Dream Dark Book. <laughs> Yay, there it is. Yay! Black Bringer and Silk Singer and the National Book Award finalist, Lips Touch, three times. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband, illustrator uh, Jim D. Bartolo, excuse me, and their daughter, Clementine. And joining us this evening, our special guest, who we're so glad to have us with us, is Stephanie Perkins, who is also a New York Times internationally bestselling author of books for teenagers and for adults with teenage hearts. I love that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was born in South Carolina, raised in Arizona, and attended universities in California and Georgia. And since 2004, she has lived in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, let's see what else here. Oh, she's always worked with books, first as a bookseller, which I know Lainey did as well, then as a librarian, now as a novelist and editor. Her best friend is her husband, Jared. Every room of their house is painted a different color of the rainbow, which we were just talking about. And they share it with a feisty cat named Mr. Tumnus, <laughs> which is awesome. So welcome, ladies. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. I wanted to say Stephanie has a 10th anniversary edition out now, too. And it's Ooh, so beautiful. Awesome. Look, Look at this. Thank you. Thank you. Look at this. What's the anniversary just... gift? Is it, is it by chance paper? Because you guys are nailing it, if so. <laughs> uh, that would be, I, I don't know. Remember what it's one are, of but... them. It's one of them. Right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice if we both had that? <laughs> Happy 10th anniversary, Stephanie. Happy yeah. 10th anniversary, Lainey. Thank so you. So excited to be here. Oh, a decade. I love it, ladies. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and let you guys chat about whatever you would like. We'll get to some questions from the uh, chat room later. So as you guys are listening, uh, our attendees, go ahead and, and drop questions in the chat and we'll get to those in a little bit. All right. Just real quick, I see that in the chat that Carrie has said that her daughter Lemon and our daughters are, are both have citrus names. So Lemon would like to see my cat who happens to be here. So I'm going to, <gasps> she's all unsuspectingly asleep right now, but I'm going to grab her oh, for she's Lemon. Oh, I love this. Yes, I've always said <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm on. Any, any pets, any children, <sighs> bring them on. We all need happiness in our lives, right? Oh, she's very big. Oh, oh, look, at, look at the tummy. Oh, look at that floof. <laughs> yes. like, hey, witch, say hi. Hi, Witch. It's oh, good to see goodness. you again. It's been so long. Yeah. Hi, Lemon. <laughs> ah. I okay. love it. <sighs> Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Now we can chat. 
Oh, yeah. Cats out of the way. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jenny, so much. Yes, thank, thank you, you to Jenny. Andersons for hosting us tonight. Um, if you haven't bought Lainey's new anniversary editions, please, please buy them through Andersons. Um, you know, like this pandemic has been so weird for all the reasons. And um, we're so grateful for indie bookstores for stepping at us and allowing us to keep touring, to keep talking to all of you and to even like reaching out to even more readers. Like yeah. I've got a good friend in Australia who's like gotten to see lots of my events this year because they're online. And so we're so grateful. Um, but you know, like even though it's free for you to attend, like this really is like a business thing. Like we need your help. Indies need your help. Please support them. So um, we might keep repeating that throughout the night, but I just absolutely. wanted to Absolutely. And also that just in. like these events, you know, it's so cool it's for, cause you know, when we go on tour, there's so few markets that we go to again and again in so many parts mm -hmm. of the country or the world that we never get to go. So I, I hope that we will continue doing these events in the future as well as in-person events because like such a small percentage of people ever, you know, happen to live in a place that has a indie bookstore that does events. Right. And so right. yeah, it's I really love cool. it. And like usually like, uh, you know, you get your schedule and it's like, oh, one event in the Midwest if you're lucky. I'm like, oh, right. the poor Midwest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So oh, how someone have you here been? from Hawaii. Sorry. Oh, I should no, like no, turn I off it. comments. I'm it. like so excited. No, no, no. I love to see when people are here. I think the last event I did last week, there was um people from a bunch of different countries. It was very cool. I oh, well, and that's so appropriate for your work because your work is so international. It's so worldly and otherworldly. <laughs> And um, and that's such a good good starting point to talk someone's about. Someone's actually Karu is actually here from Prague, according to the chat. So hi, Karu. <laughs> Karu, I've missed you. Yes, me too. <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> Canada, Michigan, LA. Oh, it's so cool. So cool. So it's how so have cool. you been? What are you, what are you what are you up to these days? Same old, same old. <laughs> writing away. I, I the last what time we writing. <laughs> So I'm working on um, my book that comes out next year, which is called uh, The Woods Are Always Watching, and it's my second horror novel. Um, and the last time we spoke, you were working on a project that has not yet been announced, but is so amazing. <laughs> but oh. you guys, like, I just, I can barely handle how amazing it is. Oh my gosh, um, I haven't so... been able to announce it yet, but I did tell Stephanie what it is. So good. I it's can't so wait. Good. I can't wait to tell. Um, uh, yes, I'm uh, still working on that. <laughs> yes, yes. And we In were this, both this like... year of concentration challenge. Uh... Oh, it's a, it's a nightmare. And I mean, you and I are always late on everything anyway. Like that's yes. a thing we share. We have yes. a very similar writing process, despite having very different end products. Like we do, I felt like we've always had so much in common and share kindred suffering. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to you about that because, um, you know, I don't think, I, not that I think that writing is, is easy for the majority of authors or anything, but I, I you know, a lot of writers that I know don't under, can't, can't understand, or, like begin to understand what it's like for us. They're like, just, just write it, you know, you can make it better later. <laughs> like, like, what are you talking about? No, it has to be the best now. <laughs> yeah, no, every sentence has to come in. To, no, okay. But right? we, can, oh. yeah, we, can, we can talk about that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so hold up your new book again. Let's see it. Do you have all three with you? I or do. Just, oh, so let's look at these. Oh, my goodness. First two. They're just so outrageously pretty. beautiful. Yeah. So this artist, her name is Yelena kevik Jurjevic, And I'm not sure where she lives, but in Europe. I can't rememember where she's from either. She's not easy to find online. She doesn't have... <laughs> Um, for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's on Instagram. You can see her art, but there's no, you know, personal information. But uh, I found her on Instagram and um, I was just scrolling through and it was at the time we were talking about doing the new editions. And um, I was like, oh my God. And at the time, Little Brown had been sending me some artists and they were amazing. Um, and there were some amazing choices. But some of them, I think, you know, I'm so, I, one thing I want to say is that I'm so happy that YA has come around to doing illustrated covers. I feel like now when you go and you yes. look at the, the, the shelves, like yes. there's just this wealth of very different styles of illustration. And um, when Anna and daughter came out, it was the era of the photo cover. Mm -hmm. And they were just both a lot harder to capture um, the essence of those books. And so I was really happy um, 
when Little Brown agreed to use this artist because I thought they would look really different than other stuff that's on the shelf. So I didn't realize that you found that artist. I, I love that so much. I love I did. That. And uh, I think I saw Alvina in the audience and I don't, I would love for her to come up. I know, I wish we could. If she's willing, Ginny, I don't know. Maybe she's like, no, I don't right. want to. <laughs> so for people who don't know Alvina, Alvina is Lainey's editor. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, there she is saying hello to everyone. Hi, Hi Alvina. Alvina. If you'd like to come up, we'd love to see you. But if you are, not, you don't feel like being on camera, that is okay. Yeah, we, we didn't really get that. <laughs> oh, there too. she is. Yay, huh? Yay. Hey. Is she I don't see her yet. Yep. Is she coming? Uh, hi. Change your view, hi. Stephanie, to gallery. Hi, Alvina. Hi. Can you How are you? <gasps> Alvina, hello. <laughs> I wasn't prepared to be on camera. That's how I'm <laughs> sorry. You're such a good your name. Thank you. <laughs> We're just like shoving you in. Yeah. I did an event that I moderated a couple, a month or so ago and I calculated the time difference wrong and I was out on a walk and I got home and my agent was texting like I was 20 minutes late. So I had to like go on camera like all sweaty from my walk. It was terrifying. But you look lovely, Alvina. Thank you. I'm in Burlington now, but I'm, I'll say goodbye and I'll listen in. Well, uh, uh, Alvina, I would just love to ask you really quickly. Um, do you remember when you first got this manuscript? What did you think oh. 10 years ago? Well, more than that. It takes longer than, you know, that to get a book out in the world. What did you think? I mean, it was the most incredible, magical moment of re like reading those pages. Actually, our, our sales director, Sean Foster, was just remembering this moment of us all getting the the manuscript and the submission and just feeling like this is really special and we have to have this so yes well, I remember yeah. you guys wooing Lainey which was very <laughs> exciting as her yes. friend <laughs> it was like I mean it definitely was the most it was the high point of my writing life was you know the the process of selling Daughter of Smoke and Bone to Little Brown. It was um, it was a very different, like a lot of people don't know that it's my fourth book, not my first <laughs> book, because um, that, you know, I didn't know that before that, that like writers got publicists. <laughs> like I was like, my what? Like publicists? That's a thing I didn't know about on my previous books. <laughs> and, uh, but so like, it was just a very, very different experience and it was so exciting and I remember our first phone call Alvina um when the book was at auction and I was so rooting for Little Brown and just waiting to see oh, how it would go and and yeah there was one yeah. moment where you know during the auction when Jim and I like got a text from Jane and like screamed and Clementine who was one at the time like started to cry <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Yeah, so um, it was very, very happy memories. Yeah. For, for me too. I, love it. So I, I will listen in. Okay, thank you for coming Thanks on. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Thanks for making that happen, Ginny. Yeah, <laughs> the technology. I know. Yeah, oh so. my goodness. Yeah, so um, I love that. So you've we we know where the book came from I think everyone who's watching this has heard you talk about those little inklings and you know seeing this this wishbone and these teeth and like what is that and like pulling the story from there but what I'm really curious about is how has your relationship to this book to these characters how has it changed over the 10 years since you wrote it that's funny I mean I haven't really thought about it in that way I mean they feel like I think in a way they feel like they're frozen in time, you know, um, at the end there, because, you know, at the end of Dreams of Gods and Monsters, I definitely, you know, as I was writing that book, I couldn't just sort of put the story to bed. I had to introduce a new storyline that hopefully in the future I would be able to pick up. And then as I was writing Muse and Strange the Dreamer and Muse of Nightmares, I, you know, found a way to interweave them and, um, you know, sort of hint at, um, future stories that could combine them and uh, and I did you know I do hope that someday I might get to tell that story and I do sort of you know picture them in that time in between the end of dreams of gods and monsters and whatever comes next um but yeah I don't know I don't know what to say like they they definitely just feel sort of feel like frozen in time and um, Karu was definitely like a wish fulfillment character for my, like my teenage self, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, at, at a time, 
yeah. Uh, when I was a teenager, it would never have, and even in my, in my early twenties, like I didn't think about writing for teenagers. I don't know why. Like I just, maybe it's because the YA genre hadn't really blown up. Maybe it's because I was a super pretentious teenager who was only reading French poetry or whatever. (laughs) Um, but you know, when I did write this book in my thirties, it was, um, it was sort of, you know, a gift for my teenage self, the kind of book that I don't know if I even would have wanted it then, but I should have. Like it was who I wanted to be. I wanted to have this big weird life and um, you know, abilities and all of that. Yeah. Um, and just in case there's anyone who is watching who for some reason has not read this book yet, why don't you I just realized like we have not said what it's about. So <laughs> What is this series? Not just this book. What is this whole series? Because we've got the full repackage here. Yeah. Um, um, gosh. I mean, I never was very good at describing it, either. even it's when terrible, I was in right? practice. Um, I <laughs> realized that I don't write books that are easy to like describe simply. But um, what did I eventually? I remember doing uh, library or was it bookseller speed dating with Alvina at like Book Expo, <laughs> and over the course of like you know every few minutes, having to like repeat a spiel. Uh-huh. I don't know if you remember that, Alvina? I got like something down but it was a it's a story of um an art student in Prague who was raised by um a monster named Brimstone and she doesn't know you know why who where she really came from who who her parents are why you know why she was raised by these monsters why why this monster exists and the other few that are like him and um in the process of finding out the answers to those questions she discovers um you know, a war that's been going on for hundreds of years and uh, the truth that she's always been after and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that you set up this whole uh, really like epic in the fullest word, meaning of the word, epic battle between like angels and I, I'm, it's been 10 years. I'm so sorry. Do you call them that's devils okay. or demons? Uh, the chimera um, mm-hmm. with like devils, demons, like yeah. anything, you know, that humans would call them just based on. Right. So yeah. I, I love that you set up this big, um, big epic battle, but that your, your focus is with someone who is aligned with the chimera. Like you're not like, like the heroes are, you know, these, these devilish monstrous creatures and the villains are the angels. And of course you've got the star crossed love, which, um, by the time you get to the end of that first book, you have set up quite a problem for those (laughs) two protagonists. Uh, Yeah. Thank you self. That was hard to overcome, (laughs) but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I always like was, uh, I always loved the idea even in my previous books, the idea that, um, that all of our lore and mythology and religion, um, the notion that what if it was based on something that really existed, but that humans had only ever seen in glimpses and then created their own stories to explain. So if, you know, humans had seen this creature, this creature, that they would naturally, um, because of the way we are, we would assume that anything beautiful is good and anything, you know, beastly or that doesn't look just like us, doesn't look like we were created in his image, then would be bad or terrifying or demonic. And um, so that was sort of the, the basic idea that these were real species that existed, that humans had glimpsed over time and created stories to explain them. And um, as for, you know, the primary seed of the book and the primary relationship wasn't the romance like that wasn't where it came from it was this it all started in this that day that I was writing for fun and the story started to come to life I remember uh, the day I remember the first day that I she mean, started we were, writing this we were emailing like crazy yeah back then. and <laughs> we called it like the the newt or something the new yes. weird thing do you remember that I like yes this. I do it was in our subject heading I'm so yeah. grateful that I blogged so much at the time because like it's still all there like I can find it and do you, you like that that long daydream that we went on like with other people about our writing cabin and how it would exactly how it would be that we just got so carried away with it's all on the blog <laughs> I still think of that writing cabin in Me the too. winter and go Me back too. there in my mind it's it's my happy place <laughs> <sighs> yeah yeah um but anyway, so there was this one day that I was writing just to try to write something else than the novel I was trying to write. And and that's the day that Carew and Brimstone really sprang to life. And it was this girl arguing with her father. And I was just fascinated with the dynamic between them. And eventually, after I had explored that for a while and, and, and understood began to understand what the story was. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to bring a romantic element into it. And I knew that 
I had an idea that I wanted it to be a Romeo and Juliet star-crossed love. And I was like, okay, well, I have the chimera. Then who, you know, would be their, like, natural enemy? And so that's when I came up with the idea of the seraphim. And they, so they, that was very much, you know, secondary, I guess, or at least in the evolution of it. And then, um, yeah, so, so Brimstone was, was definitely the primary I love Brimstone. I love that character so much. Me too. Actually, he got a cover. I saw it. One of the greatest things I've ever seen. It's the first, uh, the first Brimstone cover. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's so beautiful. Um, yeah. I, I mean, these books are so special. I mean, I love that they introduced uh, the larger reading world to your books um, because there's so much to crack open and they're so rich and vibrant and, and full of all the life and experience that you have. You know, you grew up as this person who was like globe trotting and like seeing the world. <laughs> and um, and then you wrote for Lonely Planet and you saw the world in that way. And you've, you've just always been this great lover of travel and you bring that into your, into your house, you bring that into your work. And so... Um, and it's something that I really respond to as a reader. Uh, setting is like my very, very most favorite thing to write. It's why all of my books, even though they're contemporary and they have a very different type of setting, um, I always consider the setting like one of my strongest points. And when they redid my covers a few years ago, I was really excited when, you know, they took the, the photographs of the people off and they added and it became photographs of the cities. Mm -hmm. And that felt really good because to me, like that's what that was about. And it was influencing the whole story. So um, you're this great world traveler and your home <laughs> reflects that. I mean, right there, we're looking behind you and there's so many interesting oh, little things mess. to look at. I love it. I miss. But um, where, where does that rank in terms of what you really enjoy? Because as a reader, I'm like, oh, clearly that's her thing. Yeah, I definitely love coming up with settings. And, um, and I love the way you capture a city as well. And um, when it, it makes me want to go to them. And I'm yeah, missing Paris these days. So I think I need to reread <laughs> Anna for a dose of, <laughs> of Paris. Um, but when I, when I first had come up with crew and brimstone, I had to decide, you know, I got to decide, I should say, where, where do they live and um, where to set this. And I had um, initially, I think I thought New York, just because I, I know I wanted some vibrant city. But um, I had a few years before that, I had gone to Prague with Jim. Um, we were thinking of writing a vampire graphic novel. And this was like in 2004, or 2005. And uh, we, we were gonna set it in Prague. So we went there so we could take a lot of photo reference. It was like our first trip to that we traveled out of the country after being like starving artists for a long time. It was the first time we could like afford to like really go somewhere. Yes. So we went to like, for like a week and a half to Prague and in November, it was already very cold and just walked around and like scoped it out for where the vampires would live. And it was really fun, but then we never, um, did that graphic novel. I ended up getting some interest in my first novel and completely going, oh, I better finish that then. Nice. <laughs> um, so we never did anything of that, but I already had looked at Prague um, as a setting. And so it was really perfect. And it just gave, I, I think it really did really give the book its vibe because it's like this, it, it feels like a medieval fairy tale, but it's a real contemporary place that, um, you know, teenagers could go to art school and, and um, hang out at cafes. And so it was really fun. The gas masks in the cafe. <laughs> right. It's one of I mean, that, memorable, memorable details. I love it so much. That was totally, again, a gift for my teenage self. When I was 17, I lived in Orange County, California in the pre-coffee shop era, the pre-cafe era. Like there was nowhere. We had nowhere to mm -hmm. hang out as teenagers. Like now living in Portland as an adult, I'm like, oh my God, this is a great city for teens to live. There's so many places to go and be and just hang out. But I, we had none of that. We had like Denny's and um, the nearest coffee shop was literally like 40 minutes away. And we would drive there just so we could hang out at a cool coffee shop. <laughs> Um, so I was definitely like imagining like, oh, if I had had, it's a medieval refectory, you know, where not, where monks died of poisoning in the middle ages and the co tables are coffins. Actually, when I was, um, before we moved to California, um, when I was a teenager, we had lived overseas for five or six years. And uh, I, so I went for eighth and ninth grade. I, I lived in Brussels, Belgium. And um, we, I went to an American school with the other like army and Navy brats. And um, we would go downtown at night and, and hang out. And, um, and, you know, we would 
some people <laughs> would drink or we would go to bars. And there was a bar called The Coffin where the tables were coffins. And that was in downtown Brussels in the 1980s. Um, I had not yet acquired a taste for alcohol. <laughs> so I did a lot of not drinking. <laughs> but, um, but I remember those tables. And so they found their way into the book. Um, and I remember the metro rides with my brother coming home too late. And one time we were moving back to the States and it was um, like the night before we were leaving or two nights and we were staying at a hotel downtown because we'd already moved out of our house. And my, my parents were in one room and my brother and I had an adjoining bedroom, like actually adjoining. And my, my little sister was in the room with them. So my brother and I went out to like say goodbye to our friends. And my brother, who's so brazen, he's like, didn't want to come home on curfew. So he actually called them from a payphone and pretended we were back in the hotel room, literally next door to them. So we're, we're back, we're fine. <laughs> and they bought it and they bought it. So we stayed out and I would never have tried it, but my older brother, <laughs> the bad influence. <laughs> older siblings, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we got away with it. Anyway, that's a big sidetrack, but Oh, I love that. I love that. Because I think all of those details from your life, you've lived a really interesting, rich life. And I do feel like it has, it's played such a big role in your books. Absolutely. You like there's a there. scene in, um, in Daughter where Karu and Akiva sit on top of the cathedral and eat bread that they bought at the bakery shop window. And I've never sat on the roof of a cathedral, but I have bought bread at a bakery window in Portugal, actually, like um, right when they're opening in the morning after having, you know, been out all night at the beach with, with friends. And so like that idea of like, you can go and like knock on the window and they'll sell you some hot bread. Like I wouldn't, I didn't make that up. Like I would never have known. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, traveling has been a huge, um, it's been huge. And I wish that there was like grants that writers could get to, you know, go to their places. And you did oh get gosh. to go to Paris, but you had already written the book. I did. Yeah. It was delayed. It was, uh, you know, I was a, uh, yeah, I was a, I was a public librarian. Um, they not paid so well, especially in my County. We actually have a really, really low paid librarians for like nationwide. We rank as some of the lowest. Oh, no. So like it was not in the budget for my <laughs> husband and I to travel to Europe. Um, but because I was a librarian, um, I was a great researcher and I loved research and I knew how to do it and I appreciated it. And, um, and I also had this little kernel of knowledge that Diana Gabaldon had written the first Outlander book without ever having stepped foot on just in Scotland. And those books were so well written that if you go to Scotland, even though they have this whole like time travel aspect, they're kept in like the Scottish historical section, like in Scottish <laughs> bookstores. And I was like, okay, if you can do that from far away, like I can do that too. Yeah. Um, and so it was this this, uh, you know, collecting absolutely every single book that I could find and not just, you know, like here's a book on Paris, but um, reading books uh, from Americans who spent time in Paris so you could, you know, find out the cultural differences versus reading books of, you know, memoirs from people who had always lived there, um, picking up books from the travel section, the cooking section, lots of graphic novels. Like I don't know anyone who, who researches as much as you. Like you're definitely like you're so <laughs> diligent and like so you sink so deeply into it. It's incredible. I, I enjoyed. I took uh, a French language class at community college because, uh, like my protagonist, I took Spanish in school. I did not know French. Um, and so, you know, I, I had this idea for this book um, and it wasn't what I had been expecting to write and I did not know anything about France and I was quite uh, afraid of uh, French culture really. Um, in the beginning of the book, my, my character is sent to this French boarding school and she's really terrified to go. She, she had enjoyed her life back home, and even though it's this wonderful thing and she can recognize that it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's, it's not what she asked for. She doesn't know anything about the people. She's, all she's ever heard is that, you know, French people like make fun of Americans in their white shoes and they think they're rude <laughs> and this and that. And so she's so afraid of like offending them. And so as she had to learn about the city and the culture and, and everything, I did too. And uh, Anne and I just, we, we learned about France and then fell in love with it together. The same process of, of learning first and then falling in love. Um, but yeah, I, my, my, so I, I would have loved went, to have gotten to go, but that came after the sale. <laughs> and you knew so much by then. Like, I mean, could you actually walk around and 
practically navigate I could. that neighborhood. I absolutely yeah. could. I, I never needed a map. I showed up <laughs> and like, I knew where all the things were. And I always describe it. It's like CS, CS Lewis getting to walk into Narnia. And it felt like, <laughs> it felt like I had created it. And I was like, Oh, oh. like, look at this. Congratulations, place. Stephanie. You did an excellent job <laughs> creating Thank Paris. You. Thank you. A from plus, all one of the top <laughs> cities in the world. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. I did it. <laughs> But yeah, it was that feeling of like, oh, this belongs to me. Yeah. Um, it was it was uh, really so surreal. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so how did you choose Paris then to begin with? So you started writing the book in NaNoWriMo, right? I did. I uh-huh. did. I've been working on another book for Was this like 2013 or something? No, wait, no. <laughs> no, this would have been like way before that. Because the book came out in 2007 or 8, somewhere in there. Yeah. It, it came out in 2010. Oh, it did. Okay. So mine was, mm-hmm. mine is actually next year, I think. So it's not quite yes. the 10th anniversary. Yet. Yeah. All right. It was December, 2010. So it was exactly 10 years mm-hmm. earlier from this month. Um, and yeah, and, and I'd started it several years before that. Um, it was a really slow process of learning how to write a book. And before that, I had been working on what became my second book, Lola and the Boy Next Door. I'd been working on that for several years, and it used to be an adult book. But I just kept writing more and more scenes where she was a teenager. <laughs> like, clearly, it's what I should have been doing from the yeah. beginning, but it took a long time to understand that. And so I had to put it aside because it had just been so long seven years of work, 70 pages. It's not a good track record. So I'm like, <laughs> so like, I'll try this NaNoWriMo thing just to see if I can finish a thing. And then the week before it happened, I had this, this dream where I saw this beautiful boy sitting on the steps of this building clearly in Europe. And I knew I was in love with him and I knew we went to boarding school together and I knew he had a French name, but an English accent. And like, I just felt very very crushy when I still woke up like, Ooh, who was that? (laughs) And I'm like, okay, let's go. And when I started looking up this building, I thought maybe it's in Rome, maybe it's in Paris, Florence. I didn't know. And then it was the the Pantheon in Paris. That was what my dream had conjured up. And so suddenly I was writing a book in Paris and it kind of made sense. See, I did given him a French name in my dream, but um, I I kind of like, I have to tell that story a lot because it's the book people know the most it's the, it's the one most people like out of my work. You know, you can like add up all the sales of that compared to the others. And they're like, no, we're close. But oh, I always feel a wonderful. little weird telling that story because it makes it seem like writing is this magical experience, <laughs> which it's not. It's very, very difficult. That's the one time in my whole career where like the muse came down and like gave that's me this funny, thing. That's funny because that's how I feel it. about, you know, that first day of Daughter of Smoke and Bone too. Like it's still, I've still never had an experience like that, you know, where it just, that one magical day, like everything came together. It really did feel like, you know, I understood where that idea of the muse came from because it does feel like it's coming from beyond you, like into you. Mm-hmm. And um, and I wish that it could be reliably tapped. <laughs> oh my gosh. I really needed the muse this year. <laughs> so Maybe we just have really recalcitrant muses. Maybe they're like on vacation together right now. <laughs> I think so. Mine definitely has not been here this year. <laughs> She's been on vacation. So I do want to talk about in that lens of like um, where you were in your craft 10 years ago versus where you are now. And like, how has that changed? How has your writing process changed in the 10 years since Daughter of Smoke and Bone? What what have you learned about yourself? What are you still, are you, what, what do you feel like you're better at? What are you still struggling with? Like, how has all of that changed? I love talking about craft with you. Yeah, you're one of my too. favorite people and, to talk about craft with. Yeah, so. and I'd love to hear the same from you because I know, you know, I feel like it has gotten harder, not easier. Um, <laughs> that my uh, my expectations, you know, of myself just go up and up and um, make it more stressful. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I have, a, there's a quote that I love and somebody in the comments had asked, you know, to talk more about perfectionism and and we can, but uh, there's a quote from the poet William Stafford and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but he's talking about the idea of perfectionism being a perceived, like like an imbalance between your ability and, um, I'll have to find it, Uh, basically that writing should be easy, that there should be no felt threshold to go over. Like you shouldn't have a feeling of going over a threshold to start writing. And I feel like my threshold is so high, like I have to like, climb it before I can even start <laughs> and um and so that idea that that visual of the threshold was like it just struck me like and he's like writing should not be hard like you know 
basically, I guess the idea that if you can speak or you can write a letter, you, you can write, you can write, you can put words together. And so where does it come in this, this perfectionism, this thing that for me, there exists in my mind, um, like obviously, unfortunately not whole, something I can take and put on the page, but there exists in my mind, like it's as if there is a perfect version of the book. And it's not enough that I write a book, I have to write that book. And I don't know what it is, but I know what it isn't. And it mostly isn't. So as I'm writing, I'm writing a chapter and it isn't yet. And so I have to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it until it, I have some intuition that it matches that, you know, I can't, that, that you know, perfect book that doesn't exist. So, um, <laughs> so it's this, it's, you know, and there's just this, it, I don't, um, and I, I, I know we've talked about OCD before and like, I don't mm -hmm. have clinical OCD, but what I experience with writing I do. very much feels like, <laughs> I'm feels like what, it. <laughs> so how does, how does your like life OCD compare to your like writing experience? I mean, is it like one in the same? Because I don't have OCD in life really, but I know mm -hmm. what I feel I, I experience in writing feels exactly what I, what other people describe as OCD, like that inability to, to shut off that, that faulty voice in your brain. That's like, it's yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are really similar. Um, but I, I, you know, I think as we get more and more brain research, like we just don't know so much about the human brain. And I think the further we go, the more we'll discover that there's like, there's a spectrum to everything. And I always think of it as my husband's a musician and he's got all of these like devices with all these little knobs and stuff. And I always think of like, we all just have these knobs turned to different levels. Right. And so my OCD isn't like someone else's. And so I think there's a very good chance that you do have it in a really specified area and mine just kind of continues and creeps out into the rest of the world too. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like I get really, mine, mine is so finely tuned that I get stuck on single words and I can get stuck on a single word for a very, very long time. Me too. Yeah. And one of my favorite things, one of the most helpful things that I've found over the years is just to have some mindfulness and awareness of when that's happening and to quickly shoot, I, I call it the this or that game. And I play it with either my husband or uh, Kirsten White, who I'm texting with all day long. And I send them like a screenshot and it'll of a sentence and it'll have a little bracketed and I'll have those like two words and debating between. <laughs> and I'll be like, just tell me which one so I can move on. <laughs> and I play that game with them all the time, <laughs> this or that, um, because... I just can't, you know, in most, most places I can figure out what it is, but I will get snagged on a thing and they're both, they're always both technically correct. They just slightly alter it one way or the other. And I just can't move on. And that's really where it gets, um, I, I feel like it makes me a better writer, but it can also hinder me. And that's where it's like, yeah. oh no. So it's, it's a, it's about mon monitoring it. Yeah. I mean, it makes like, you know, I think in the pros and the end product, it's visible. But I mean, I, I think that it's true for you as well, that it, it makes the process joyless <laughs> and yeah. difficult. Not always. I mean, there are always those moments of, of grace where you, you just go, why can't it always be like this? But um, yeah, I mean, like, anyway, it is what it is. And we just have to figure out how to, how to work best work with our brains that we have. Yeah. Um, so I would say that, you know, I, I have, come to terms with certain things about myself over time, but there's always that part of me that's like, there's gotta be a better way, like a different way. And I'm, I'm never give up hope of like finding a way to, <laughs> to not, um, you know, to not struggle as much. Yeah. I, I felt, I felt my body relax a little when you said like, well, it's gotten harder, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like not all authors say that. And, and it's definitely how I feel. It has gotten harder every single year, but at the same time, um, while, uh, for all the same reasons that you've listed, like my expectations are higher and such, and, and I'm more aware of craft, like the more and more I'm aware of craft, the more and more I'm judging myself against all these weird standards that I'm creating for myself. And, but, um, on the flip side, um, I have also gotten a lot more gentle with myself and understanding that that's a part of my process and where in the early years, I used to really, really beat myself up over getting stuck like this and taking some time. Um, I finally come to a place 
it, you know, like it was, it was so destructive in here that it almost just like shut down the whole operation. And I almost yeah. had to just like completely back away. And I didn't want that. I wanted to keep, you know, in this career and this job, I wanted to keep creating stories and decided to be like, okay, well, what's the healthy way to do this? And if I can't make myself go faster, I just need to be a lot more gentle with myself. And so I'm a lot more understanding, like, I, I wish I could write quickly. I wish it were fun always, but um, this is my process and I'm comfortable in that. And it's going to yeah. take me a while. And if I write 200 words in a day, like that's a good day <laughs> and that's okay. And so have you felt that shifting at all either? Like having more grace for yourself? Um, periodically I do, but then it's like always lashes back around. Um, you know, the last few books I've realized and, and Al Alvina is out there. <laughs> you don't know this, but, um, but, you know, Daughter of Smoke and Bone was sold with the first big chunk done. And then after that, and that's always the hardest part for me. Like I'll spend easily a year on the first quarter yes. of the book and then the rest tends to get a lot faster. And, um, and then, you know, I was in a, a great, amazing position to then to be able after the trilogy, um, not to say those books were easier, they were hard in their own way, but I wasn't creating the world from scratch or whatever, but I was able to then, um, sell my next couple of books on pitch and so it's a whole different story and I think now like looking at it in retrospect because the book I'm, I'm writing now is also sold on pitch that there's just a different level of oh my god is is this a book that they thought they were going to get like um, I am also uh, writing a book on pitch <laughs> and it's just like the grass is always greener because of course we want to be able to sell a book on pitch in order to have a career and be able right to, like we're super we're lucky that we can do that <laughs> yes <laughs> and so then leave it to me to find a way to like stress myself out more. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. None of it makes any sense, but, um, but so I don't know about the gentleness. So, you know, the book is due and there'll be times where I feel like it's going really well. I mean, it's all day by day, like a great writing day begets a great mood and a bad writing day or a slew of them then is, you know, um, very <laughs> bad for morale. Um, and this book is, just, it's really a challenge. It's been, it's been a challenge. I feel like I have, um, you know, attempted things with my last few books that I would never have been able to do when I was a, a less experienced writer. Maybe in this book does feel very, it just feels like I'm always like bashing into the outer limits of my abilities, which I always want to feel that to a degree, but, um, mm -hmm. but there are definitely like big periods and because of the way I write, the way I don't like, I'm not really able to outline in a detailed way. I just, my, my stories don't work like that. Um, there's always this like degree of faith that all these pieces, these like um, balls that I'm keeping in the air, or I, I, sometimes I think of them as like yarn balls that are like rolling across the room. They have to intersect in an elegant pattern. I'm just like, trust that I will be able to make the pattern that I want. I don't know what it is yet. I won't know what it is until I get to, you know, act three, whatever. Um, I just have to sort of trust that I will find the way that satisfies that, you know, the complexity meter in my brain or whatever. Um, and so I never know until it happens. And so there's always stress up until like the very last page. Um, and I, I have faith that I will, but it's always just that like, when's it yeah. going to come? When's like, when's that, you know? Did so. you have problems this year uh, in terms of concentrated concentration? Like, I, I mean, that's just such a general thing to throw out there, but like, I, I struggle like, like I'm always slow and that was turned so far so down this far. year yeah. and I would have trouble like remembering what I had written. It was just really hard to keep my story in my head this year. Oh my God. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like if I think back on it, it's hard to even remember the sequence. Like I'll, I'm going to forget a major catastrophic event. Yes. Like there has been so many, I mean, for me, not that they're all catastrophes, but early in there before the pandemic, even I was completely like obsessed with the primary because there was a candidate right. <laughs> that I was very much pulling for who did not um, get the nomination, but I was just really involved with it. And so there was that. And then we went from that into the pandemic. And then, um, you know, there's just so many other things, including then massive wildfire coming practically to the brink of my city. And, and I'm, my daughter is home um, from, you know, homeschooling right there. <laughs> and, um, and Clementine uh, does, you know, she, she's at an age, she's 11, where she can entertain herself a lot. And, and um, it's much better than if she were, um, you know, younger and needed much more supervision. But, uh, but still, it's been a whole other component. So yeah, it's been, it's been a have challenge you, for sure. Yeah. Have you found post-election your concentration coming back a little bit? 
I mean, it's been up and down throughout. I think after the primaries, I was able to just be like, all right, shut it out. Um, mm -hmm. But then there was other things. There was all these other things along the way. Like I was able to be like, okay, there's nothing more to worry about. I mean, not worry about, but there's nothing more to bother obsessing about with that right now. <laughs> um, like my obsessing about it is not going to help anything. Um, but then there would be the next thing, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, it was just an onslaught. <laughs> <laughs> no, like what were the things? There were so many things. Black but Lives yeah. Matter. That was a big one. That one came, oh God, yeah. that one came when an editorial letter arrived and I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. I mean, in my city has had protests like every single day since, since, yes. you know, and except for during the worst of the wildfires when the smoke was too bad for people to go, go outside, we've had like Portland's been torn apart. And um, it's not like we experience it that much here. Sometimes the marches go by our house, but it was like hard not to be really obsessed about it. Right. So. And it felt like, I, and I mean, it's so important. And like, it was that wrestling with all day long. Well, like, that's what I want to be looking at and engaging with and learning about and yeah. participating in. And so it was really hard Supporting. to like remind myself like, oh, I still have a job. I still have to earn a living. Right. Um, and it was that constant. Yeah. It felt forth. so important and, to be present for all of that. Right. And, um, and, and general, amplify. I think, yeah. And, and general, I think some of my, so I also have ADHD. I've got a lot of things you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I have, and I've but, asked myself, like, like, could I have ADHD and OCD? Like, is that a thing? Cause I think <laughs> absolutely a thing. I, I have both. I have been okay. medically diagnosed as both. Um, like I've, I take medicine for both. Like it's a thing. Um, and so honestly, like a lot of the tools I, I was diagnosed, uh, as an adult. And so it's been a whole learning curve with that. And a lot of the tools I've learned with that have helped a lot this year and like bringing me back to the work. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's the noise canceling headphones. It's the turning on freedom, but most importantly, it's like just not checking the news until my work is done for the yeah. day. And, and I have to set, I set hours for myself, like for years, I took copious notes of like the hours that I worked the best during and like, was this a good day or a bad day? What was I working? What at what I eaten? When were my breaks? And like, I found the kind of my corridor of like, okay, my best work is done between these hours. And so now, and it's, it's early in the day, which kind of surprised me. I'd always been a night writer and suddenly yeah, like, I remember oh, no, that morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so now it's like, I, I can't, um, I lose energy by checking the news. I lose energy by checking texts. And so I just had to like restructure yeah. my entire day. And that's kind of how I've been getting through my work yeah. for the year. Well, I also got a um, ADHD diagnosis as an adult. <laughs> and it's funny because all those things that you just said, those were strategies that I had had to develop, like the noise canceling headphones mm -hmm. and freedom and all of that. Freedom's an app where you shut off your access to Wi-Fi for a certain period of time um, that can, you know, just as a way to not let yourself Gift. fall prey to, <laughs> um, to your tendencies. And um, so I know all of those things. And yet with every sort of onslaught of new distraction it was like hard to then make myself do the things I knew I needed to do yeah yeah and that's when you just have to have that gentleness and forgiveness with yourself and say oh that's okay like this was a really hard day and I'll try again tomorrow and um, I think that's really important in keeping up morale in really hard times and like tomorrow's always another day and like it's okay it's hard for everyone right now and, um, and yeah, just don't check the news until your work is done because for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Then your whole day is gone. Yeah. So we'll probably, yeah, oh I gosh. see Ginny. So we probably should, um, do we have some time for some audience questions? Yeah. So We're this is my virtual head popping in to say, yes, thank you. I was I kind hate, of eyeing the time, but it well, just went so fast. Stop this lovely flow of conversation, <laughs> which people are really, really appreciating, especially on the air of the honesty of all of that. So thank you both for, for sharing those things. Yeah. It's really appreciated. Um, yeah, there are some questions in the chat here. So let's see. Yeah, I saw this first draft question from Jeff about um, writers wanting their words to be perfect on the first draft. And what would you recommend to writers who struggle with this? Um, I, I mean, I would say, I guess, a, very, a variety of things. Um, you know, for on the one hand, uh, being able to shut off your inner critic and get words on the page is the most important thing. But it might be that for your brain, that's not sustainable for an entire draft. Um, for me, uh, my books are long and, and, and dense. And like, if I take a wrong turn in the first act, I'm not going to continue to write, you know, another 100,000 words, you know, based on that of a rough draft. So I, I um, do it scene by scene. I'll usually try to write fast draft a scene, and then I let myself edit it um, so that 
and I build that way. And then so that my first, my first drafts by the time I actually get to the end of the book, they tend to be fairly clean, even though they still need like, you know, full editorial overhaul, you know, to make it all work together. Like the, I have, I have already gone through that, that process. So it may be that, that you don't need to write a whole fast first draft that, that might never work for you. And maybe it will, and maybe it doesn't work now, but it'll work later. Like our process continually changes. Um, <laughs> I, I read a quote somewhere that it was like, um, there's two, there are, there's two of you. There's the one who wants to write a book and the one who doesn't. And so the one who uh, doesn't, you have to keep changing your process to trick the one <laughs> who doesn't want to write the book or something like that. So you never know, like change your process. But, um, but for me, I allow myself to do what I need to do because also there's a lot of reasons why slowing down and making that chapter what I need it to be before I go on. Like I might have to scrap it later, but also I find so much of what becomes important to the story in that slowing down and in that revising as I go. Um, a lot of the the language callbacks and the the, 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 the the sort of thematic resonance comes from language patterns that would only happen if I slowed down like that. Um, I find a lot of it in the actual prose craft. So uh, for me, I, I do let myself, um, you know, perfect it as I go, but I still have to get something on the page. And so that is when <laughs> a timer, noise canceling headphones, I actually listen to the same album on my noise canceling headphones over and over. It's like my drafting trigger. As soon as I hear PJ Harvey stories, <laughs> or stories from the river, stories from the sea, or is that how it goes? I go like, it's like, as soon as I hear that first beat of big, big exit, like I go into drafting mode, it's crazy. Um, and then, and then later I fix it. Stephanie. Um, I mean, you said, you, you said it all. Um, I use scent sometimes <laughs> when I sit down, I've been using this for 10 years. I have the same scented lotion and I'll like dab ah. a little bit under my nose and it's like, Oh, it's time to work. And so huh. that's like this little, I've heard that very candles silly. or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's this very silly thing, but um, yeah, it's really hard to just get those words out so that then you can mess with them and uh, timers. Yeah. 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 It's, it's horrible mean, though. Yeah. There's like this, this phase for me in a section of a book in a scene or whatever, where the, the mushiness before you know what it is, is like intolerable. Yes. And it's so hard to cope with that. Like, I don't know who this person is yet or what this room looks like or any of it. And I like, hate that period before I like sculpt it, whittle it down to like, I can see the details. And then there's this finally, like, it just seems like it takes forever before I, before it's real enough in my mind. And I, I have the little hooks to hang on to enough to make it a scene. And um, I think that, I don't know, there's so many ways that it's impossible to sort of express what the perfectionism does to you, but like that, the intolerableness of that mushy first draft, I think just, it, it's like a quicksand that does not want to let you go. Um, until you fixed it. So have you tried Holly Black? I don't know where it came from. I just saw Holly Black tweet about it first. The thing about writing in a in comic sans. I you know I saw that, but I haven't tried it. No. Oh, it helps. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I am it, trying it, writing it, by <laughs> hand right now. Um again. Like I can't I, do that. Periodically, I wish I, could. I periodically try because I definitely don't like edit myself as much when I'm writing by hand. But then I've like later questioned whether it was really useful or not. So no, no, I, I <laughs> think <laughs> for me, drafting in an ugly typeface has been helpful on occasion, huh, not every okay. time, but you know, it's that like constantly trying new things and every now and then I'm like, okay, let's try this and it'll work. I can get that draft. Out. I can get an ugly draft of a paragraph out if I've got yeah. an ugly type. That, I'll have to try that. That's so funny. Yeah. I've, I, I've heard, heard a lot of writers talk about ideas on writing and I can say I've not heard either of those. I think the, the, the scent thing is so interesting, Stephanie, because, well, because I mean, it's a real thing that scent is one of the strongest yes. memory sensors, right? So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And I love the idea of writing in a ugly font. So that, <laughs> and I love the like, I love the saw... anti-comic sansness of the whole idea. <laughs> no, I think it was Clara wow. Bell Ortega said she actually drafts in wingding sometimes. Oh my god! But she can't even read what she's writing. Well, I don't imagine like you have your your fingers like one I know. off on the oh, keyboard. That's, that's, what, I, all that's what I'm imagining. And then <laughs> the whole like, thing, yeah. you change it and you still can't read it. Right. Can oh we just god. for a moment like recognize the fact that wingding still exists though? I like, know. <laughs> Why is that even still a part of Microsoft Office? Like, but it used to be so exciting. You could actually put a symbol in your, right. in your text. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. But, uh, but no, there is something about that set of triggers. Like uh, even for me, when the freedom 
um, you know, when you enable freedom and it has that little like box that pops up saying freedom like that in combination with my music starting, like it creates this new space in my head. And so I can see how scent, you know, it's all creating a trigger for your brain or like a new, like you've changed the channel. Yeah. It's time to work now. Yeah, totally. All right. So a couple of questions here. Um, Tara says, I know it's like asking to pick your favorite child, but which was your favorite book to write? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know which is my favorite to write. Uh, it's, I don't have, I mean, I don't really have a favorite book. I hope the, the book I'm writing is always my favorite because I hope that it will continue to go in that direction. Though it's also like, you know, the devil child at some yeah. times as well. Um, I mean, I do have really fond memories of Daughter of Smoke and Bone because it, it did start in that magical way. And then it was a struggle for a while. But, um, but then also when I, after I sold it, I did write the book of that book in like a summer, which now I think... I wish I could always do that. That would be amazing. Um, like what's wrong with me now? Why can't I do that again? So I do have really, really sort of magical memories of writing Daughter of Smoke and Bone. Yeah, I'm gonna use this opportunity to jump in and say, remind people ah. that this book exists. Lainey and I are both in this. So this is an anthology that I edited a few years ago and this was the most enjoyable experience I ever had uh, creating a book. And it was because I'm only one twelfth of it. <laughs> and I just got to work with lots and lots and lots oh, of other wonderful so people. Oh, it's so wonderful. It's such a wonderful book. I loved being part of that too. So, and I love that you did that. And we're still waiting. We're waiting for fall next, right? That's your season. You have to done. do it. <laughs> done. Yeah, I did a summer one as well, but this is the one that Lainey is in, so you guys should pick it up. It's definitely a December read. Her story is wonderful and magical, and I love it. And mine is very hallmarky, but in like a less cheesy oh, way. But yeah. it's a Christmas lot it. story, Christmas tree lot story. So, and buy this from Andersons tonight, you guys. I'm, I'm putting <laughs> it in the chat as as we speak here. So. It's a perfect book for this time of year. It's like you it know is. all those um, holiday movies. Only it's it's better than them. All the stories are better than those. Um, I mean, there's some good ones, but you know all those holiday movies. It's, there's a lot of stinkers too. But there's no stinkers. Are, I I I will defend the stinkers every day though. I love <laughs> the full range, and that was why I wanted to do that. Okay, like, I, want them all. I have to say, somebody posted a graphic. I don't know if any of you guys saw this on Twitter. Somebody posted a graphic of all the covers of those movies together, and it's sickening how they're all the same they're all white couples and she's always wearing a red sweater and he's always wearing a green sweater and they're yep. all identical and it's like why yeah. like <laughs> yeah and that it's a very non-identical book the stories yes. are all the book really, is better really different and rich um the book got uh four starred reviews i'm so proud of that amazing. it's a good one yeah, yeah. and nice. you did a yeah you did an amazing job it's such so, a great idea so some lightning questions for laney i'm gonna shut my mouth well, <laughs> I, I really like this next question from, from Kat. What came first, the idea for the book or the desire to write a book? Uh, I mean, I always have a desire to write a book. I guess I'm just trying to figure out what that, what that book should be. Um, so in the case of Daughter of Smoke and Bone, it was, uh, I was trying to write a different book. And then it was the day that I sort of sat down to write just for fun and, and crew and brimstone appeared and it seemed like magic at the time like they came out of nowhere but I later realized not to get into it but that um it was a part it was a result of all these exercise writing exercises I'd been doing in different blog communities and that all of these things that became them were like seeds that had been planted by doing writing exercises like free writing for fun and so they they very much came out of that but um but so those characters came first and then there were some questions on that first day like about the wishbone about the teeth and I didn't know what the answer and so it wanted to be a story. And, it, and when I figured out what the story was, I realized it was a book. So um, I, you know, I was looking for, I mean, I guess I wasn't actively looking for that to be a book, but I was, anyway, I'm always trying to write a book, I guess. <laughs> well, I love that that actually dovetails into the next question that somebody said from someone else, um, Mickey, who said, do you build stories around characters or build the characters into the story you want to tell? So clearly for you, it was characters yeah. first. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I have um, like a premise, a situation, a world building element or an idea first, but I can't go anywhere with it until I have the characters um, and until the situation is like an integral part of, of that character. Um, so like with Strange the Dreamer, uh, it came out of the idea of the Muse of Nightmares and it was actually supposed to be called Muse of Nightmares and it was supposed to be one book um, about Sarai. Uh, so Zalavina will remember this. <laughs> um, and I emailed and said, oh, what if it was two, where I think it was first, what if it was Laszlo's story and it was called The Strange the Dreamer? Um, but that definitely, the idea of that whole series was the character of Sarai. 
Um, and then I had to figure everything else out around her. And then Laszlo came along and stole the, <laughs> stole the whole thing. Um, so, All right. So this is a question I'm going to ask both of you. And I think it might be a nice way to kind of wrap up this part of it. I know there's a lot of other questions in the chat, but um, we have to get to our, our little VIP meet and greet after this as well. So what books are you giving as gifts this year? That came in from Heidi's wife, well, didn't it? I think I saw her. Oh, Heidi. Hi, Heidi. Possibly. Yes, yes. Yay. Hi, Heidi. Oh, that's such a good gift. What are you giving people, Lainey? What have you loved? Um, let's see. I got a book for my dad that's called like Five Came Back or something. I don't know if you know about this, Stephanie, but it's a yeah. film book and it's uh, it's about five directors who went to war in World War II and how oh. how like Hollywood shaped the war and how the war shaped Hollywood. So I got that for my dad. Um, I got some books for Jim. I don't know if he's watching, so I shouldn't say. Clementine's really into the, um, I, I'm not gonna be able to remember all the books I got. Uh, oh, I ordered a book for, for Alexandra today. That's something in Paris. It's about a racehorse wandering around Paris and it's by, does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's like that starts with super fun. It's like it's like a, a fancy racehorse name in Paris, and it's like this the horse wandering around Paris. Fiction or none? It's fiction, and it's like Ann Tyler or one of these like you know big time hmm. authors, but I can't remember which one. Does anyone know what I'm talking about, Ginny? I I don't. It's, is it new? I think so. Oh, you know what? You know where I found it? I think it was on that BuzzFeed um, article that announced our oh our event. So it was on there. Anyway, it sounds like it's animals, like a dog and a horse, and they meet up with like other animals oh. at like Perestroika. Perestroika. Perestroika oh, in Smiley, Paris. Yeah. I think that is it. And um, Jane Smiley. Yeah, it was, it's not Ann Tyler, but somebody big. There and it go. just sounds so like lovely and sweet, like animals wandering around Paris together. So um, it sounded very Alexandra. <laughs> How about you? Um, I bought for my nephews, Adam Gidwitz's trilogy, Grim Trilogy. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one is A Tale Dark and Grim. And they're these middle grade books that are very funny and bloody and gory. <laughs> so I thought my nephews they're would great. love those. Yeah, I love them as their aunt who writes horror. <laughs> In addition to my romance, I write horror. Um, they're so smart and charming. So I, I, I finally read them this year. I devoured them and then I'm like, oh, I have to give these to them. So that was my first purchase. I wish I could remember. I, I bought them a ton. I like Auntie Steph always buys them a ton of books. So I got them a few other series they were reading, like the newest Wimpy Kid. Um, oh wait, I had another question that I forgot to ask you. I want to know what's up with the movie. It's coming soon. Is it coming soon? Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, so oh, Stephanie's the movie, horror movie novel oh, was made into a movie on Netflix and <gasps> it's all filmed. And is it ready to come out? When's it coming? It is. So it's, it's called, there's someone inside your house based off my novel. There's someone inside your house. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a very traditional teen slasher. Um, I love those movies as a teenager. I love them now. And um, the kind of cartoony B movie over the top. Um, I love it. And so, uh, yeah, it was filmed almost entirely before COVID, but they were about to start reshoots, um, which is totally normal for a movie. Um, they had four days of reshoots and the director had just landed in the city where they were shooting when Netflix called him, like, like plane literally just touched mm -hmm. down. Netflix called him and they're like, we're shutting down production. <gasps> So we, I mean, we were grateful. They, they like, as far as film studios were concerned, they shut things down before the others did. They, they really kept their, um, their employees safe, which I appreciated. Um, and it meant that like, they'd already done all the pre-production stuff. So we were ready to go. So we became kind of like the guinea pig for Netflix. And in August, they opened it back up. The cast and crew went back to Vancouver, quarantined for two weeks inside a hotel <laughs> together. And then they were able to shoot those last four days. So it was supposed to come out this fall, but because of that delay, obviously they couldn't get it there in time. So next year at some point, maybe on the earlier half of the year, but we have, we have no idea. Um, Is it, it going to be, be scary? Is it going to be really scary? I think, I mean, that's such a subjective <laughs> question, right? Like for me, I'm like, no. <laughs> But for most people, I think like, yeah, a little bit, like if you're Chad scared of things, so. but yeah, <laughs> but there's a lot of, there's a lot of humor uh, involved in a slasher film generally, which is why I like it. And there's also a romance. Um, yeah. It definitely humor. has that, you know, Stephanie Perkins romance just with like, just, with, blood. Slasher elements. <laughs> just with a lot of death. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, but this, the screenplay was, was awesome. Um, the, the man who wrote it did Shazam a few years ago, oh, which was yeah. such a good screenplay. I, Henry Gaiden, he's so talented. And the director is Patrick Bryce, who did some horror films that I love. Like, it's just like, it's awesome. And the, the producers, the people who did Stranger Things. So like, you can't top that. Like, it's really good. Well, I can't wait. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes. <laughs> It's going to be interesting, you know, in the next couple of years on, on, on TV and screen content, but also in writing content of the things that were delayed or changed or pushed or whatever word is appropriate um, projects from this year that what COVID does to the arts world, mm -hmm. as far as what's going to come out in the next few years. And do you incorporate COVID as a thing that happened? Can you set a book in 2020 and not have COVID? I mean, that's the question yeah. a lot of shows are dealing with right now, but you know, I mean, we're is this all sort just of overwhelmed be... too. Right. Watching Grey's Anatomy just... makes me like really antsy because it's all about COVID and like, <laughs> I need Jenny, you really. have touched on like the question that contemporary authors, I we know. are talking about, we are texting about, we are very upset and don't know what to write right now. We're like, yeah. what is the world right now? What's it yeah. going to be? Right. Um, are we going to go back to normal after this or is this to a degree, like, is there a certain element of new normal in this? Right. I mean, are masks going to ever be completely behind us? Um, and that like... like in 50 or 60 years, will COVID books be the new World War II books? Like, or is it you just, know? A, you know, are there going to be a cycle of increasingly frequent pandemics? Okay, let's not get depressing. Right. <laughs> oh, I think Yay, that there's going to be books, content holidays. no matter what. There will be a, a, a breaking of the dam of content coming towards us and art from creators such as you guys that I think we have to look forward to, honestly, of, you know, things that were delayed and we're going to have this rush of them coming so I think we yeah. all have anything to look forward to was really just not like, like the movies that are like uh, the pandemic there's like some movie coming out that's like Americans are like getting dragged right. to camps for, you know and yeah. hiding in their houses and like we don't need those yeah I, that I did have that. I did have a couple weeks early on in the pandemic where my husband, I just got hooked on big budget blockbuster disaster apocalyptic films. You're not the only one. Right. Yeah. We were a part of that whole rush where like that we could not get enough of that. And every night it was a new disaster and like, <laughs> like surviving the disaster. We're like, whoo, phew. It was very cathartic. Right. We, we sold so many books on plagues in the couple first <laughs> months of everything. Honestly, we had a, like a list on our homepage of books about plagues and pandemics. And we all looked at it like, who are these? people that are reading books but about this but there uh, it helped people get through it I guess to see that there was an end yeah. I don't know but you're yeah <laughs> it, it felt good to see the world saved again and again and again every night um maybe that's it yeah yeah, yeah. And, but now but I'm like no, actually have no more. a conclusion yeah <laughs> right. Right. I've switched to holiday romances I've got a huge stack of them <laughs> <laughs> yes yes like we also don't want like election dramas right now either right like I keep the political no away I can't it's enough yeah. right <laughs> All right. Well, um, I know there's a ton of other questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, everybody. But um, I do want to let anyone know that if you did purchase a book ticket this evening, then you are about to get a second email through Event Combo with a second link. So we can move on to that portion of it. Um, but to everyone, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank um, you. And to Lainey and Stephanie, you check your email as well because I sent them that your way. That was also. And um, everybody else, we really appreciate you. If you ordered a book, we are um, going to be working on getting those out to you. Please be patient as we are human beings in a basement <laughs> processing about a bajillion <laughs> internet orders. Um, so this event coordinator is like shipping out books now. That's kind of how the job goes. So um, we will get them to you as soon as possible. I promise. I know you're very anxious to have them in your hands, but thank you so much for spending your time with us tonight. Thank you to Lainey and Stephanie. It's been lovely being a fly on the wall for your fascinating conversation. Thank you, thank you Jenny. Thank you, Anderson. Thank, yeah, thank you, Anderson. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Everybody out there, stay safe. Um, and if you uh, purchased a book, check your inbox in just a couple of minutes. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.